Welcome everyone to our monthly happy hour for Lean Portland. I'm Brian Hurley. Um, I'm not in Portland anymore, but I'm still a regular attendee to these meetings. Also connected with Ann Moses, who's going to be the speaker for this evening. And she invited me to her uh, virtual graduation last year. And um, I got to see a lot of great presentations. And so after that, I, I wanted to get her on our happy hour cycle here and and find and have her share the program that she's going through um, at the King County Department of Information Technology. So thanks for everyone for attending. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about Lean Portland if this is your first time. So Lean Portland, we are um, a group of Lean and Six Sigma prof professionals. And, you know, Maria mentioned that we've been getting together for quite a few years to just network and talk about ways we can have an impact in our community. Um, it's been really great to have a good sharing platform to learn from each other, but also we wanted to figure out how can we give back to the community. So we've also done some nonprofit pro bono work. And so anytime we can learn from each other and figure out ways to better serve the community and teach others about Lean and Six Sigma methods, that's been kind of our mission and goal here. Um, so, so our goal is to help people make work better kind of what brings us together and and um, where everything kind of falls under this umbrella. So our happy hours are one of those ways in which we can share. So you can find us at leanportland.com or you can email us at leanportland at gmail.com. Um, we also have a Slack channel. We haven't been using it as, as often, but we do have that set up. And then you might have found us through the Eventbrite and um, through our or through our LinkedIn group. So if you are on LinkedIn, please check out our LinkedIn group, just under Lean Portland. And then also you can subscribe to our events on Eventbrite. You can also join our newsletter and you can get notified of upcoming events. So we have the Tuesday happy hour that we do every month. We've been doing that for quite a while. And sometimes we'll have speakers like tonight and then other times we'll just have activities or discussions or dialogue. So we've got a couple of those coming up this year. Um, we also do the pro bono workshops more so when we were in person, but we have restarted some of that this year with some virtual sessions. And so in, on Eventbrite, you can see some of the training and education opportunities we have. Sometimes we do those donation-based, but most of the virtual ones, I think we've gone back to just doing those for free. And also we're trying to develop new instructors to teach some of the basic courses. So we have a wide variety of expertise in our group from those just beginning to those who have lots of years of experience. So that's been um, good to try to figure out ways to get people some experience that they're not getting maybe at their regular job or work. And then we have the pro bono work that we do with the nonprofits. So trying to go out and work with organizations like the Rebuilding Center and Free Geek and um, some new organizations we've added this year. Um, so we're constantly experimenting with what will work best to help teach some of those organizations that are doing great work how to do their work a little easier or better or more efficiently. And these are like some of the upcoming events we've got. We've got um, a discussion about 2022 and what our plans will look like and how you can help steer the direction of our, our group going forward. Um, we'll also be talking about um, the community consulting changes that we're making with uh, more of a structured format in a more condensed version of activities. So we'll give an update on what we've been doing this year around that um, with specifically um, our work with Solve and Portland Fruit Tree Project. Are those the two? Yep. So we have two cases that we can talk through on how that's gone. And then in December, we've got um, a couple hour session. It's called an unconference. And this will be a chance for us to come together for those who are interested in, in working with other nonprofits and teaching them about lean methods and how we can use these methods to improve our society and our environment. We're gonna have an open discussion. And so whoever's interested, please sign up for this and attend. You set the agenda, you decide what conversations you wanna have, what topics you wanna discuss, and it's pretty free flowing in terms of what, we, what rabbit hole we go down, but the overarching umbrella with this event is to bring people together who are trying to figure out ways to expand our knowledge out into the world to address, you know, bigger societal challenges. So 
if you're interested in that topic, please check out the unconference in December. And that's a free event. Okay, so today we've got Ann Moses. She's with the King County uh, Department of Information Technology. King County is um, the county surrounding Seattle, if you're not familiar with the state of Washington. And uh, she's going to talk to us about a lean greenbelt program that she's put together to really go after racial equity and social justice across the county. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Anne to kick us off. Thanks, Anne. Great. Thank you so much for that, Brian. Hi, everybody. I'm super excited to be here. And yes, maybe a little nervous, but I'm just going to dive in. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm really pleased to be here with Lean Portland. And I remain amazed at the virtual space's ability to build community, even though we are all together apart. So throughout my presentation, please leverage chat as a way to ask questions. Um, I'll do my best to stop a few times during the presentation to also ask for questions as well. Um, one of last year's graduates, Sarah Hospidor, is on the call with us. So if there's a question that comes into chat that she's like, oh, I can, you know, take a cut at answering that, um, she will. So just know who that is. And Maria and Brian, please, you know, weigh in as well if there's, you know, something that you just want to let me know about that I'm not seeing. Um, just interrupt. Um, and as Maria said at the beginning, this is really intended to be an informal space. And I'm planning on staying for the conversation at the end as well. So, and I'm already interested in the December 7th unconference. <laughs> so I'm really pleased to be here. I'm gonna share a little bit about a program that two colleagues and I helped create in uh, King County that incorporates principles of equity and social justice as well as lean principles. And one of the first principles is that we always ground ourselves. Um, we always, all of the classes that we teach, I have students each lead a grounding in. And even in our regular work, we try to be intentional to take a moment to ground in. We can't always do that in all of our meetings, but we really try. So. Um, this is a voluntary exercise, and if you'd like to participate, I invite you to put both feet firmly on the ground. Allow yourself to just kind of adjust your posture. Maybe kind of just do a little bit of stretching. There are probably some kinks that want to get worked out. Um, just tune into your body for a moment. And at your own pace, I invite you to um, intentionally take deep breaths in and intentionally really allow an intentional exhale as well, really squeezing your lungs. Our lungs are masses, sort of like sponges. And when I exhale, I find that it's just this really nice way to um, just kind of allow my lungs to get some exercise and refresh. So on your own for the next 10 or 15 seconds, just however many deep breaths in and out feel right for you. One final breath in and out. So thank you all so much for participating in that. Um, I wanna share a little bit about me. This tree that you see here is, um, it's a tree about the determinants of equity that is used in uh, many of King County's basic equity classes. And, uh, and 
I've been my department, one of my department's lead co-trainers for racial equity classes for about six years. Um, I went through, uh, I think it was a 60, 40 or 60 hour, I can't remember at the moment, um, training that was led uh, by a woman who's not with the county anymore, but she coordinated what we called our racial equity academy. And by going through that course, um, you really learn to prepare to teach racial equity classes. So I've been teaching racial equity classes in my department again for about five or six years. And just three years ago, I got my green belt in lean continuous improvement through the University of Washington Tacoma. And I had already found many people I identified with in my racial equity work. And as soon as I took my first lean class, I was like, oh, it just felt like the other side of the coin for me. And um, so this ability to combine my two passions um, just feels like a gift. Right after I took my green belt, I got my black belt. Um, and it was soon after that, that I partnered with two additional um, co-workers here in uh, the county to develop this program. Before I dive in much further, I want to be really upfront about an elephant that's in the room. So I identify as a white woman and I'm leading a racial equity program. So that in and of itself, like I need to be aware I'm not posing any white superiority or any white savior complex. And it's really important to me that everybody on the call knows that I developed the program in partnership with two other colleagues in the department who identified as uh, BIPOC, as people of color. Um, I would have never attempted to develop this program on my own. And even if Nicole and Ed weren't there and I was trying to move this forward, it would be really, really important to make sure that I was bringing people of color in as curriculum developers. And I invite everybody who identifies as a person of color on today's call. If there's anything that I do where I misstep or I miss say, or something just lands wrong for you, it's really, really important to me that I get that feedback. So I'll have my, I think I've put my email address in. If I haven't, I'll make sure I add it in chat before I end. So feel free to email me directly, or if you feel comfortable, just unmute and let's have a dialogue. Um, so anyways, because I identify as a white woman in the racial equity space, it's really, really important for me um, to say everything that I've just said and I mean all of it from the bottom of my heart. Whenever we talk about racial equity at work, it's not something that we normally do. And a lot of us don't have a lot of practice talking about it. So it's inevitable that there will be missteps or there'll be awkwardness. And so it's really important to me that I model how I approach this from a place of authentic authenticity and love. Um, because for me, that's such an integral part of racial equity work. So um, the picture in the middle of me and my dog is the picture that I use when I'm in racial equity training classes. And then the picture on the right is a picture of last year's Greenbelt candidates. Um, so I just wanted to share both of those pictures as well. Um, okay. Lean and equity and social justice. As I had mentioned, I'd been on my equity journey for a few years before I kind of discovered my lean journey. And as soon as I saw the two of them together, I just was like, oh my gosh, there's such a natural alignment here. Um, so these, I'm not going to read them, but these I really believe that these are the core similarities of both lean and equity and social justice. And here in King County, our executive Dow Constantine is just an amazing leader with great vision. And he's really pushed both lean and equity work. And an unintended consequence has been that as those visions have 
been trickled down through departments to implement, there've been these competing challenges like, well, I can do lean or I can do racial equity. Like we don't have the resources to do both. So that's another reason I'm really passionate about this program because it really brings these two visions together and it, um, it eliminates this conflict of interest and priorities. It avoids duplicate work um, and it really leads to more equitable outcomes. It also eliminates the false belief that lean and racial equity are in conflict with one another. So um, the, depart, uh, the program that Nicole, Ed and I developed is steadily growing. So in 2019, we had four projects. This year we have seven. Um, you can see the themes for each of the projects in this middle section. And you can really see that our graduation participants has really, um, we've seen a nice steady increase into 2021. Um, if anybody's thinking about developing a program like this, I really encourage you to start in very incremental stages. Um, this has been very successful for us, and I feel like we have a really solid program that's going to be able to last, and I really credit that with developing the program in stages. Um, I'll pause there. Um, I see some things in chat, but I don't have my chat box open. Are there any specific questions anybody wants to ask, ask at this point? All okay. lots of thank yous and appreciation so far. Uh, one question I came up for me yeah. just looking at this slide, is this program open to all departments in the county? Yes. Or is it focused yeah. in anywhere specific? Okay. Yeah, um, so in 2019, the program was only open to a few departments, and it was three departments where, this is a little complicated, but there was an, there's an overarching group within the county that was working on kind of lean and prioritization. And then leaders from three specific departments were saying, Where's the equity? Like we're on board with this. We just really like to see greater equity. So in that first year, we kept um, attendance to just these three departments where we knew that leadership was already advocating for that integration between lean and continuous improvement. As we moved into 2020, we were able to expand to a few other departments. Um, another thing that I'd really like to mention is in 2019 and 2020, we had only frontline staff, so no supervisors or managers participated. Again, that spirit of lean continuous improvement from a racial equity perspective, investing where the needs are greatest as well. In 2021, we have one uh, kind of mid-tier frontline manager, not necessarily an upper manager. And that's been a really important part of our program as well, is that this is really intended for our Gemba, you know, where the work is happening. Um, so from here, that's an overview. This next slide is also an overview. So the program has 15 classes of formal instruction, and then we have graduation. Um, I have I, I'm wel I welcome anybody in this call to attend graduation this year. So I have a little thing about that later. Um, I think I had on my last slide, I have the wrong date for graduation. So it's really October 22nd. <laughs> um, and I'm just putting, Sarah, can you help remind me about that when we get to the point where I can let people know about options for attending? Um, we, I teach a define, measure, analyze, improve, and control approach to continuous improvement. The county as a whole formally teaches PDCA. I just have a personal preference for uh, DMAIC over PDCA. Personally, I feel like the plan section is front loaded with so many things that it's hard to be successful that by being able to break it down into define, measure, and analyze. <laughs> It just gives our students more critical thinking tools and thought process. 
um, again, if you chose to teach something like this on your own, you, you teach it the way that it feels right for you. Um, the program requires sponsors, and I asked for um, relatively high level sponsors. If I can, I get all the way up to you know, division levels or department levels. Um, and I ask my sponsors to attend two meetings with each with the team. So one towards the end of the define phase when the team is really getting a sense of what their problem is. And then one at the end of analyze right before implement, because uh, for graduation, the pres their pres graduation presentations, they're required to present three recommendations. And I ask our sponsors, look, you're gonna be checking in with the team twice and that second meeting, they're gonna be sharing their preliminary thoughts. I really am expecting you to support the candidates to implement at least one, if not through all three of the recommendations that they bring forward. So I'm setting that expectation with the sponsors up front, and then we're building in the meetings with them, which is beyond what this uh, slide is showing you. This is just the instruction curriculum. Um, this third year is the first year that I feel like I'm getting my ducks in a row in a way where those sponsor meetings are working the way that Ed, Nicole, and I envisioned when we were first building the program. So another thing to simply be aware of is um, that, you know, do it in steps. Don't try to get everything pulled together in the first year. Um, another really important thing that I want to point out is that the curriculum intentionally includes several racial equity classes. Um, you see this RPOI here in June. You see float number one about white culture. So um, we re I require that students attend a half day class called ESJ Fundamentals either before, regi before participating in the program or on their own in the first few months of the program. It's, key, it's King County's standard kind of introduction to racial equity. Um, hi, Joy, I see that you have your hand up. Yes, I do, and I'm sorry I didn't get it up faster with you. Yeah, your that's okay. Slide, but um, I'd yeah. love to talk to you offline because I have done something similar, mm -hmm. um, and this is our first year yeah. in Indiana, um, but it, it's got a different um, scope of participants. But yeah. anyhow, what I have discovered, and so this is my question for you, yeah. that our, um, the traditional Demaic material mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, was too manufacturing focused. And so when we revise the material for the next cohort, yeah. we're really going to see how much we can um, revise the material without yeah. compromising. You know, we want to maintain the integrity of mm -hmm. the material, but we've got to get um, some of those menu a lot of the manufacturing examples out yeah. and get more equity examples in. Yeah. But, you know, the folks who created it, they just didn't have the background right. or community equity examples to really build yeah. that in right up front. So my question yeah. is, with your core Six Sigma material, yeah. so the core yeah. mater material, yeah. not the float stuff that you have right. at the end right. or the stuff that you just right. talked about at the beginning, just were you, did you comb? the manufacturing stuff out or how, how did you handle that? Um, well, I like watching lean videos the way some people like watching cat videos. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, um, you know, part of it is learning by doing, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of my videos are just videos that I'm able to find for free online. Quite a few are from Gemba Academy. So a shout out to Ron Pereira. Um, some are from some other groups where they've got the, you know, the cartoon drawing that are walking us through the best steps for doing a Gemba walk. One I just showed in the last class was just an interview of a woman who was talking about leader standard work in the healthcare field. So mm -hmm. Um, I don't, 
I, I don't necessarily use an overly formal structure mm -hmm. of how to introduce each of these. Um, when we meet offline, I'm happy to, you know, share a few of my lesson plans with you and show you the slides and just kind of explain. And, um, you know, like I showed this one video, um, it was a, one of those cartoon writing videos. So I think it was about best practices for a gimbal walk. And I said, I don't like that this video implies that only men can be in management because there's like one little line in it about, you know, your manager, like they used he, he him for the manager. I said, yeah. I don't really like that, but all these tips are solid and right on point. <laughs> Okay, I, I like well, that. We'll talk we offline because unfortunately yeah. we were retrofitting yeah. a traditional Six Sigma class that was already there. Yeah. Which was a little bit, well, not a yeah. little bit, manufacturing yeah. focus. We we're trying to retrofit that to get that um, equity focus. So thank you yeah. for sharing. Yeah. And, you know, there are times where I really have to be very intentional about the videos that I choose. So if I have a choice between a video where a person of color is narrating and I see a lot of racial diversity in the examples, I'm absolutely gonna choose that video over a video where a white person is narrating and I'm seeing very little to no diversity in the pictures or the examples that are being shown. And so it's little things like that that make a difference as well. Um, and then uh, I just want to share a little bit more about this because I think this is a really important part of the program is, so we ask participants to on their own attend the county's standard half day racial equity class. I ask that the entire cohort take race, the power of an illusion together. It's an all day course that uses material from um, a documentary series, um, I think it was California Newsreel who published, who, who produced it, and it's often appeared on PBS. If you Google race, the power of an illusion, you'll actually find an entire website dedicated to this three video series. Um, and King County has just created a one day workshop that really dives into our country's history of race and racism. Um, and the city of Seattle has a similar course. I think there's similar courses throughout the country. Um, and I require that our cohort go through this together because I see it as much as a team building exercise as a learning exercise. And Sarah, can I just put you on the spot? I mean, can you just talk a little bit about your experience attending Race the Power of an Illusion with your cohort last year? and how it affected your ability to use an equity lens in your project. Sure, I can answer that. So uh, one thing I'll say is that, I mean, it really, you know, as she says, it really is a team building experience because uh, you're all um, absorbing this material at the same time and so sharing those reactions to it. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things where so many of us have been involved in this work or at least, you know, either tangentially or been paying attention to it. So. Um, so you feel like, oh, yeah, no, I know this, I know this. Um, I even heard that from some of the BIPOC folks that, I, you know, that were going through it, that they're like, I, you know, I'm not going to get anything out of this. And then, and then they still did, right? They still learned through this experience, but also having that, that team experience. Um, I will say that as soon as I got home from, you know, the, the King County day, I immediately found it um, through the library and rewatched it with my husband. Um, so it's one of those things we, we do have in the chat, uh, you know, thank you, Helen, Linda, for um, uh, putting that uh, link to the uh, Biblio Commons. And, and that is the three part uh, series, uh, but having the way that the King County put it together, taking all the best bits out of it and then creating breakout rooms and, and really uh, making sure that we really practice talking about it. And, and when you practice talking about this work, um, it, it really, it doesn't just affect the how 
the your work in the program is or how your work on this specific project is but you have this now these tools to talk about this uh with friends and coworkers and family and you know you ended up being able to take it into all parts of your life um so and is that kind of what you're hoping for yeah thank you mm -hmm. um i'll open up for questions again in a minute the third course here building racially just king county um, is currently on hold due to COVID. Um, it was originally a three-day workshop, one day a month, that was offered by Hackman Consulting Group that many, many leaders throughout King County were taking. So it um, it's kind of an advanced racial equity class um, that is currently on hold. And then the fourth class is Transforming White Privilege, which is a two-day advanced racial equity class that's really intended for everybody, regardless of how we identify racially, that really dives much, much more deeply into the system of racism and ways that you can find entry points to interrupt and transform. Um, I share these four slides because these are KCIT's core training arc. Um, and in the ESJ Greenbelt, we're asking participants to participate in the first and second one in a portion of the fourth one, which is um, a module specifically about white culture, which I'll talk about again in a little bit. Um, so any questions again before I move on? I just wanna ground us in kind of uh, the county's approach to equity and social justice. It looks at both big picture systems and daily lives. So it acknowledges individual, institutional, and structural racism and the impacts that these have both in on daily lives and the fact that it's really a system and the system operates in such a way that it makes it uncomfortable to talk about, it makes it difficult to even name, it makes it difficult to interrupt. Um, racial, you know, racial injustice and racial justice are rooted in individual impacts and in systems and in history. It looks at individuals' access to resource, power, and privilege, which really gets at lived experience. It gets at those determinants of equity. Um, the more access people to have to parks, to, to parks, to good schools, to healthy grocery stores, to stable uh, job security, to public transit, um, those are all resources. And when you have more access or easy, more easily readily, readily, readily available access, you're gonna have more nutrients to really support you in your quality of life. Uh, again, this comes from Hackman Consulting Group. It's an integral part of the three-day training building at Racially Just King County. Racial equity work is hopeful. Um, and I, I really believe that from the bottom of my heart. And I think it's something I really ground myself in. And I think it's important to remind ourselves of this because Talking about racial equity can be awkward, especially in a mixed race setting. Um, and the more we can normalize it, um, just the more hopeful and the more of a chance that we have to really make meaningful change at, the, at, at that big picture system level. I, share, I shared this slide with another group of lean people. And I was like, you know, in the racial equity space, we're really moving from blame, shame, and guilt into curiosity, humility, and empathy. And they made a great point. Like, we're doing this in our lean space as well, right? Like, we're moving away from the hero managers who know everything, who want to guilt you and blame you and shame you into curiosity, humility, and empathy. So yet another integral example of how racial equity and lean continuous improvement are truly integrated. I know I'm taking longer than I meant, but I would love to have people uh, go up to the top of your screen and you'll see you are viewing Ann Moses's screen. If you go to that little view options to the right of it, 
um, and click the down arrow. And if you click on annotate, an annotation bar should show up. But I'd love to have folks use the stamping tool like the heart or the check mark or the star. And, you know, just out of curiosity, humility, and empathy, which speak to you, or if there are other words that you want to add, like justice or respect or love. All right. So thank you all for doing that. Now I want to share some of the examples of how we are incorporating equity into Lean. I do everything but require voice of the customer as one of the tools that we use in the define phase. And when we're talking about voice of the customer, we're being really intentional. Who's being included? Who's being excluded? Are we interviewing a range of people by age, experience, gender, race, and role? Um, we talk about implicit biases, um, you know, not only in in-person settings, both individual and group, but as we're moving into, um, We've been in our virtual environment so long that these implicit biases are really important um, as we move forward as well. And are you aware of needs and circumstances for each group that you're interviewing? And this has been really helpful. I was working with one kind of sponsor team. Um, so the project team was like, we want to interview like 12 people. And then when, and I was working with a new sponsor group, so I was really building the relationship. And so when I went to the sponsor group to say, hey, the team really wants to interview around 12 people. And they panicked, like, what? Like that, it felt like half of their group. And I said, well, remember, it's really, this is an equity and social justice greenbelt program. So it's really important to include men and women and people of different uh, races and on all three shifts. And it's like, as soon as I said that, the dots connected and they went, oh, of course, 12 people makes perfect sense. Um, so, you know, this is how we do this in the voice of the customer. Um, in stakeholder analysis, what's important here is not really the words here or what your stakeholder analysis grid looks like. What is important to me as an ESJ Lean Greenbelt practitioner is helping everybody in the class understand that BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, People of Color folks are going to have more challenges navigating office culture and politics than their white colleagues. So if you're, if you're navigating a stakeholder analysis as a person of color, it's adding a whole nother layer to the, you know, I mean, I'm a white person and I already know that there are politics in the office. So it's really important as part of the curriculum. And this gets back to um, this white culture module. Um, I, just, I just put it out there to help make sure that everybody is thinking, is broadening their understanding of the stakeholder analysis. Um, this is a fishbone diagram and it's from this year's program when I was meeting with the team and we had these thumbs up for the items that met their criteria. I just was like, oh my gosh, I love your creativity. Um, you'll notice that we actually have a fishbone labeled equity. Um, and so we actually, we name it as one of the areas where there are potential barriers in a fishbone diagram. Another way that some of our teams do it is they really do disperse the equity throughout and they show the fishbone diagram, but then they show it a second time and they've highlighted which items um, they consider equity. Um, because like lack of team building can also be considered an equity issue. I mean, really all of these can be considered equity issues as well. So it's just different ways to help people be thinking about equities really in everything that we do. And so um, Joy, back to your comment, you know, as you're making that transition away from the manufacturing floor, I just wanna, 
encourage you like equities and everything. We just have to be, we have to, we have to see it and we have to be able to name it. And by naming it, we can then start to change it. Um, a few more examples and then I'll pause for questions again. Um, in the measurement phase, I'm a huge fan of the check sheet. And that's because it doesn't require any additional tools. You don't have to have a computer. You don't have to know how to chart. It's literally just a piece of paper. And I'm working on improving an onboarding process right now with um, one of my teams in KCIT. And I'm just asking people like, please, every time in onboarding, you process an onboarding, let me know if it went well or if it didn't go well, just jot down that note so that we can collect the data and understand where the pain points are. When I teach about the Pareto graph, I mentioned that it was, you know, first, the principle was that first defined by the Italian economist Vilfredo Pareto in 1896. And he showed that approximately 80% of the land in Italy was owned by about 20% of the population. So I'm like, this might be one of our first equity graphs. So again, like helping people connect dots and see equity in different ways. Um, this is to me, one of the most important things. Um, I know that, you know, there's always this question in the lean community. Are there really only seven wastes or are they eight wastes? And well, you know, people is really baked in into all the other seven wastes. So why do we need to name it as the eighth waste? Within the ESJ Greenbelt program that I teach, I just require that we acknowledge the eighth waste of underutilized people. And this is in large part, like King County just recently named racism as a public health crisis. So if we can name racism as a public health crisis, we can name people as the eighth waste. Um, so if you currently only teach the seven wastes, just a gentle ask that you consider formally including people as an eighth place. Chevy. Hi, uh, I'm wondering, um, yeah. do you consider resistance as a form of waste? Like you're, mm. you're using, oh, yeah. you know, like that energy of resistance rather than instead of, you know, trying to improve something, you're actively resisting the process. I have never thought of it that way, and you're spot on. So do I have your permission to incorporate that into the program? <laughs> oh, yeah. I got it from your slide because I was thinking like, yeah, a, you know, a yeah. waste could be, yeah. you know, you're actively resisting something like resistance management yeah. in OCM work. You exactly. Know? Yeah. And um, so, yes, um, I just know from my years of racial equity work that Anytime we actively move the needle towards a more, rest, more just society, it's inevitable that there will be resistance. And sometimes it shows up in places that you least expect it. So just be prepared for that. <laughs> and I love this concept of it actually being a waste. Um, so yes, thank you for that. Um, any other questions? I'm, I'm going to move. This is kind of the end of the ex specific examples of how we're incorporating equity into our lean work. Um, I just have a handful more slides before I move to the next, I mean, before we end, but I am moving to another section. So any other questions? I want to share this. Um, this is a slide that I was first introduced to when I was participating in King County's anti-racist white action group. So King County has affinity groups, Black Native American leadership count, uh, no, uh, Black African American, as well as Black African American women, Native American council, um, 
and I'm, I can't remember the others, but basically the five most common racial narratives. So Asian, Asian American Pacific Islander, as well as Hispanic, Latino, Latinx. Um, we have a military veterans group as well as an LGBTQ group plus group. So in my participation within the anti-racist white action group, this slide was shared and I love this slide um, because racial equity work is all four of these things and it really requires skills in all four. And the same can be said for our continuous improvement work as well. Um, knowledge and self-awareness cannot be the only slice of the pie. It absolutely has to include internal buy-in and personal commitment. Relationships and networking is essential, as well as implementation skills and ability. I, I've mentioned several times how awkward it can be to talk about racial equity just in general, let alone at work, let alone in a multiracial setting. So it really requires all four of these things to continually be to be built upon, to con continue to strengthen not only one's voice, um, one's ability to continue to move forward. Um, from here, I just want to share some other examples of how we weave equity into every session. Um, I did a little bit of a grounding in at the beginning of class today. I ask our students to lead a grounding in. Um, King County used to also do a native lands acknowledgement, and we have put a pause on that because native communities are not all on the same page. Some native communities are saying, this just feels like a checklist. It's too painful to be sitting in meetings to be reminded that our lands have been taken. Um, others are like, we think it's important to remind people of this history that was, you know, glossed over or romanticized as we went through school. Um, but or because of all of that, the county has put that on pause. So I've asked our, our students originally started to do a land acknowledgement and now it's more of a personal reflection on land and or one's own equity journey. And this year's cohort just floors me every time anybody leads that. And um, Joy, again, um, I think this is an integral part to incorporate into a program because it gives students that opportunity to actually lead and to speak from their own voice. And, you know, students are nervous leading up to it. And it, every time it's been incredibly transformative. So just something to think about. And I can just share from my own experiences. Um, we always do the best we can to bring current events into our virtual classroom. I've already spoken a little bit about the Native American land acknowledgements. We've talked about Atlanta's mass shootings. We've talked about Santa Clara's uh, transit authorities, mass shootings. Uh, two of this year's projects are in King County's Metro department. And one of the projects um, works in a, their project is working in a space that is very similar to the space in Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority. So when that shooting happened, which again, if you know anything about that particular shooting, it was a white man who I believe had worked there, who literally had a loaded gun and was walking past white colleagues and predominantly shooting and killing people of color. The discovery of the multiple unmarked graves at former Canadian Indian residential school grave sites is another one that we've mentioned. So again, in the news, there are racial equity things happening day in and day out. So it's just being intentional to weave this in by seeing it, by naming it, by talking about it, we bring greater awareness 
to being able to move the needle both, again, at individual levels and at systemic levels. And then through the classes that we take and these conversations, um, we're constantly, I'm constantly coaching our students to, you know, how is equity playing into this? How is equity showing up in this? Um, I just want to share this picture from not this year's cohort, but last year's cohort. So this is another example of how we were incorporating equity. Um, we shared information about um, gatherings that were being held in the region for people to be able to participate in. And the program is continuously improving. So last year's graduates are supporting this year's candidates. I'm learning to engage sponsors in a more effective way, and I'm continuing to grow as an instructor. The program this year looks very, very different than the program looked in the first year. So for anybody incorporating this into your program, give yourself a lot of grace and just know that each, each year the program will get better. All right, almost done. Um, this year's graduation is gonna be Friday, October 22nd. We're gonna have three projects present in the morning and three projects present in the afternoon. Our seventh project is on pause. And so they're gonna present just to their sponsors sometime before the end of the year. If you're interested in attending, I'm happy to invite you to either the morning or the afternoon. Sarah, will you type my email in the chat just so that people know how to get a hold of me? Um, so I'm welcome to extend an invitation to any of you on the call um, to attend. And Brian attended last year, and it led to me being here today. Uh, we always end uh, our racial equity classes by asking ourselves how we're going to hold ourselves accountable. So let me briefly, let me just, I want to return here for a minute and then also just reflect on all the different examples that I've shared. And I just want you to think, my hope is that I've been inspiring enough for you to be thinking about something that you'd like to do. Um, in this world, in this Venn diagram overlap of racial equity and mean continuous improvement. And then for those who feel brave enough, I'd love you to open up that annotation bar again, and this time choose the text feature and just go ahead and type, type a commitment. And I didn't know how many people were gonna come, so I just made 12 boxes and there are more than 12 people here. So feel free to share boxes or type something in chat instead. But um, I'd love to have people go ahead and hold yourself accountable to something a way that you'd like to grow. I just wanted to call out, I can't write because uh, I'm calling into my phone today. Uh, yeah. so sorry if the audio is strange, but I just want to acknowledge that uh, in our Lean 101 class uh, a few weeks ago, it actually came up around the eighth waste, around not using people well, yeah. and this this view of it uh, with that equity lens. And yeah. that was something that I'd never really considered before. And I think, it, you know, looking at everything that you've done here, it, it really helps to reinforce why it's so important to expand on that not using people well or people or, you know, and go into greater detail of it's not just talents and, and kind of the way that we always presented it. So, um, yeah. you know, this definitely will change the way that I, I teach some of these subjects. So thank you for that. Great. And thank you. And, and really, thank you all so much for just your time. Joy. Have you received any negative feedback from um, individuals saying this is some form of CRT? And if yes, how have you handled it? Fortunately, I have not. Um, the program is, um, it's a little bit under the radar. We don't, we don't advertise it extensively. 
Um, and I really work, identifying my sponsors is a really important part of working with teams. So I'm, I'm already working with leaders who are excited about this program. Um, and that's been really helpful. Um, so that's how I can answer that. Yeah, I'm in an environment where the minute <clears throat> it looks like, well, anyway, yeah, you I, know, things that aren't I didn't, to get, get yeah. attacked and it's, it's political. Yeah. So I was just wondering if you were having to deal with well, that. Well, and great. there's, there's so many challenges because right now, CR, people are using the term CRT to literally mean almost any type of talking about race or racism, which yeah. is not the origins of CRT. And again, that gets back to that resistance comment that I made earlier about whenever we work towards justice, racial justice, it's inevitable that we're going to encounter resistance. I just wanna quick throw in here, this is Sarah, that, um... Honestly, you know, there was so much that I learned last year through this program, but the one thing I keep coming back to over and over again are the PowerPoint slides about resistance because, right, we keep hitting it over and over again, and it has so many different forms. And sometimes like, uh, you know, one of the forms of resistance that it was like this huge aha was that someone was just swamping us with information. And it sure seems like they're on board, right? But actually they swamped us with so much information that it created a barrier and an obstacle. And when we realized, oh, that was actually their point, right? Is to appear on board and yet it, it's another form of resistance. So there was so many different ways that resistance can appear that we really learned a lot of that last year through Anne's, uh, through Anne's section on that. So, um, so yeah, so certainly we see a lot of resistance in this program, but boy, it sure takes a lot of different forms. Yeah, as soon as Chevy brought up the um, resistance, I was also thinking of the uh, over-processing waste and yeah. um, just the amount of over-processing that, that various people have to do like when you swamp people with information. Yeah. Or just over processing from a BIPOC standpoint of like, how do I even enter this space and like negotiate for some small amount of power just to get a word in? Yeah. Speaking uh, as a white woman on my own equity journey, attending Race the Power of an Illusion for the first time as a student was an integral part of my journey because I didn't really realize it at the time, but I'd been having resistance. I didn't, I didn't want to admit that literally simply because of the color of my skin, society was granting me privileges. You know, I mean, this was before I could go into a bank to get a car loan or apply for a home loan or even talk to a realtor to have, you know, the, you're in the realtor's hands. They're the ones who are going to tell you which houses to go to. I mean, that's changed now. But um, as a white woman on my own personal journey, there was a lot of resistance at first. So I, I, Maria, as you were speaking, I just wanted to share my own journey. You're spot on about the fact that resist, um, about that over-processing. I was over processing my resistance. That's what I meant to say, because it was so hard. I mean, I was scared to admit that I really did have advantages. Um, and I used over processing with the resistance. So thank you for bringing that up as well. Chevy. Hi. Um, Hi. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad we're talking about resistance because I just finished a research article or reading a research article about the backlash of racial equity work. And I think it answers a lot of the uh, what we're discussing here. But when I, uh, recently I've um, I've been thinking about I mean, first, you know, lean and racial equity work is my two big love. So when I saw this, I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> so I've been trying to think of of how to, how to use um, lean process improvement and Six Sigma to approach equity work. So the other yeah. side of 
of uh, approaching this equity work is I think of like the pro sci ad card model for OCM mm -hmm. organizational change mm -hmm. management, supporting the individual as they move through. And a lot of that work, I'm currently trying to develop a framework on how to deal with resistance as people are trying to move through that ad car phase of mm -hmm. understanding racial equity and equity type of work. So mm -hmm. I'd be interested if anybody ha has done this type of work before and could help me guide the work. I mean, I have a very rough sketch, but I don't know if I'm headed in the right direction. Thanks for listening to my home phone voicemail system. Thanks. Chevy, I don't have any specific resources for you, although a friend just recommended a book. I can't remember the title. I think it's something like Facilitating Change. I'm happy to work with Maria and Brian to actually get the title and have them send it out to all of you. Um, my colleague who is also identifies as white, who's also um, a racial equity trainer, trainer recommended it to me. And I mean, I, I bought it as soon as he told me about it and it just arrived earlier this week or late last week. Um, he mentioned that it's a way for facilitators to hold the space for change. So it, I haven't read it yet. It may have some resources. And I would say just continue to follow your instincts and also reach out um, to others who, you know, whose opinions you value and trust, um, because I've really found that, um, you know, the team makes the dream. So just really being able to work with your, with your sphere of influence and with your support team. Thanks for that. Well, so we'll send a link at the end of this too. With okay. um, when I get the video published, I'll send the link out to everybody okay. registered, and then we can also attach any additional links or content or book titles or I think uh -huh. some of these other ones we can capture out of the chat too, so that everyone's got that. Mariana, hi, um, thank you. I was wondering if y'all would be interested in also um, looking more into uh, Tema Okun's um, uh, work on this dismantling uh, white supremacy or divorcing white supremacy culture. I found that, that her uh, resources have been really helpful and vital in some of the change management work and equity work that I've been doing, um, especially early on when we started our change management um, uh, project and the, re the resistance and the mm -hmm. defensiveness that kept popping up into our, uh, into our meetings early on, mm -hmm. like were, uh, I found in my experience were, uh, made it harder to build that trust, especially when mm -hmm. improving processes and procedures to support yeah. staff. So I highly recommend, um, they recently updated their website mm -hmm. and has a lot of useful content in, I, I, yeah, I, yeah, I go by their work. <laughs> I would love, can we make sure we add that link as another one of the links that gets sent out with all of this? Um, yeah, I want to um, just jump in here because I know several of you are working with Deandra Wardell and her anti root cause racism project too. Also, the, there's a group called Women and Lean who's been compiling um, a list of resources. So there's like so many resources lists out there. Um, would love to get as many people connected to those as possible. And um, just on a timing note here, about this time, I usually open some breakout rooms for people to continue the discussion. These are the kind of um, breakout rooms where you can uh, enter on your own, uh, they, and so you can leave anytime and come back to the main room. So you should see them open now. One of them I didn't name. Um, so I put one out there for resource sharing. That's a great way to connect people with resources. We'll try to gather, if someone could gather up a list of them um, and then we can make sure that goes out to everyone. We also always open one just for general networking. So if anyone wants to hop in there, that's available. And then we'll keep this main room going and just keep this discussion and Q&A going as, as long as Anne has time and Sarah 
and as long as people still have questions. So I have a question. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, Amanda. <laughs> So I have a little bit of a technical question. So uh -huh. when you showed um, how the program works, like how you yeah. from design to measure, how are you training? Like how many hours does someone spend in training, just learning about Lean, Six Sigma, Demaic, uh, and actually kind of going through the green belt portion mm -hmm. of the course? I don't have a specific answer for that. Um, the formal instruction sessions are roughly two hours each, but sometimes they're a little more, sometimes they're a little less. In addition, I meet with each of the teams in between class. Um, so if you're participating, you're going to see me for instruction roughly every other week. And we're going to, I'm going to meet with your team at least once in between. Um, and sometimes I'm meeting with teams more than once. I find that the beginning of the project and the end of the project are the two times when people are busiest um, because it take again, because we're choosing projects that aren't traditional lean manufacturing projects it, and it, they all have an equity component. It can take a while to really get through that defined phase. And then if I'm also working with a group that I've never worked with before, I'm reaching out to the sponsors and to the project team even more than if I'm working with an established team. Um, because you know, it's an opportunity to work with the sponsors as well and you know, just share more about lean with them um, as well as with the participants. So, I don't have a set number of hours. I don't really know for sure. And I don't want to be held accountable on a recording. <laughs> hey, Amanda um, and Anne, I can share yeah. with uh, the program yeah. that I have how many hours. Yeah. Um, it was six session, six, eight hour sessions just to get through Demaic. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you, I think it should have been more um, mm -hmm. because folks coming from the community, they're just very unfamiliar with this. And so I underestimated how much time it would take them to ramp up. And so we jumped into it too fast. So I know six, um, six eight hour sessions sounds like a lot, but for community folks, it needed to be more. So we could take a little bit more time ramping them in to Six Sigma, when you have that manufacturing um, background, you get, you're, you're able to get there fast, but without it, it takes more time. And then their project work, it's um, 120, 120 um, days, is that right? Yeah, four months for them to do their project. So that's the application part of it. And, and I'm estimating, now I'm going to find out when I actually send them a feedback form, but I think they're spending maybe five hours or a little bit less per week. So I think that turns out to be about maybe 60 to 80 hours total. Um, but again, the instructor and I are evaluating the length of the program, whether or not we need more time. Because again, with community folks, it's just taking them more time to get it than if you were a manufacturing person. So those are some hours for you, but <laughs> this is our and I, first. And I agree. I agree with everything Joy just said. <laughs> <laughs> so you just let them know. There you go. Thank you, I Joy. love this hand, though. I just, I think, oh my gosh, this is just um, awesome. And thank you, Brian, for initially reaching out to me because I remember you talked about the initial I think that was the graduation I was planning to make, but I couldn't make. Yep, yep. And I'm so glad I made this because it's just a bunch of like-minded people here, right? And, and we really get it. We love it. We're passionate about it. We see the magic that happens when you bring these disciplines together. So, I mean, it's late here and I'm tired, <laughs> but I am just giddy with and everything that you shared. So job well done. I love it. Thank you. Thanks for coming, Joy. And yeah, Anne, this has been really great. 
Um, and uh, it's really nice to get a group of like-minded folks together to just, you know, it's like that after work conversation. And I often say that like continuous improvement, it can be hard because you're often the one that's going in and, and facing a lot of that resistance. Like what are we gonna change? And being the one that's kind of like poking at, can we change and how are we gonna change? Um, so it's nice to be able to kind of go behind backstage with all of, of the rest of us and, and share ideas and our learning. So thanks everyone for being here. All right. Thanks, Anne. That was great. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, you're welcome. Feel free to reach out anytime. I, I'm passionate about this. <laughs> <laughs> thanks everybody for attending. See you next month. <laughs>